Good morning. Good morning. Well, I'm so glad to be here with you this morning. I appreciate uh, the fact that you're here to praise and worship together with the Lord Jesus. Uh, and let's begin our worship today with our call to worship. It's in the bulletin. Will you rise and sing with me? Revive us again. to um, testify to our faith, and we're using the Apostles' Creed, which is uh, in your bulletin today. So I ask you today, as Christian men and women, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of Virgin Mary, suffered upon this life, was crucified and dead. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into hell and stood on the right hand of God the Father of life. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful testimony that comes to us from the original apostles. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. It's number 464 in your hymn book, and that will set our mood for today. Presbyterian Church, and I'm delighted to be here with you uh, to worship together this morning. You know, it's a bright, bright sunny day, and uh, having the Lord Jesus in our lives 
gives us a bright, sunny outlook on most days. Uh, and even on the days that um, aren't that bright and sunny, the Lord provides help and encouragement. And so I'm glad that you are here today uh, to receive that help and encouragement uh, and to rejoice in God's provision for us all together. Now, uh, I know that we have some uh, <coughs> events coming up. So uh, would the folks like to speak to those events about... Uh, I've got the four o'clock on my calendar today. Bruce, you want to say something about I've that? I've said it many times enough, I say, be here if you're interested. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we got the uh, we got the pews dusted off up there, so we've got plenty of overflow seating and everything. So we'll fill up these and then we'll get up down there and we'll see how see how things go. Hopefully fill up. And the piano has been tuned. I don't know if you noticed how wonderful it sounded this morning. There we go. Well, let's see if that's William. That's not. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, what are some of the other things that we have going on? I was talking about the oysters, so um, give us give us a lowdown on the oyster supper. Who can do that for us? <laughs> uh, we're having oysters, right? That's a real question. Uh, next Friday, the 10th. And uh, I'm reminding myself when. I think it's 4 o'clock. 5 o'clock. Thank you. I was wondering when uh, the chef showed up. About 3. About 3, that's what I thought. 2 30, 3. All right. Okay. Good. And even if you don't like oysters, because maybe not, might not be number one on the menu for some of us, there's going to be plenty of other food. So you can come and have friendship and fellowship with uh, folks as, and not necessarily have to be an oyster. I'm the, I'm the guy out in our family. My mother and father both loved oysters, and my brother loves oysters. And eh, not so much. Uh, but I'm all for the fellowship of getting to getting together. So I appreciate that. Uh, what other uh, prayer concerns do we have or other information that would be useful for us to, to talk about this morning? There, there was a, actually a prayer request that came in Concern, but um, I had a uh, lady that I ministered to out in Bath for uh, quite a long time. In fact, the whole time I was there, um, she was 90 years, 91 years old, and she passed away um, yesterday morning. Um, and I had um, had the opportunity to go out and uh, talk with her <coughs> last Monday. Um, and her son was feeding her uh, some lunch when I was there, and so she was awake. She had not been out of bed for about a week. Um, she had kind of just gotten um, gotten tired and went to bed, and then didn't didn't get up. But she was comfortable, 
and uh, her uh, four children were there uh, along with hospice to take care of her, and uh, she passed away yesterday. Uh, so uh, another pastor and I from Bath County, who's also been there quite a long time as I was, um, both knew the family, and, and actually he and I shared her husband's funeral back in 2001, um, and we're going to share her funeral then in the next, next few days. So she had a good life. Uh, she was an integral part of the ministry there at Wendy Cove, uh, but she will be, will be missed in the community. Uh, absolutely. Now, uh, we have set aside this day for our four cents a meal, um, and that's an important uh, program. Uh, we took that offering up, as you all do, uh, out, in, uh, out in Bath, and it was put to good use out there. So let's take up our four cents a meal offering. <laughs> set aside this time to uh, pray together. Um, I will be uh, leading the prayers and then eventually uh, I'll be calling on you to join me with, uh, with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the way you are working in the midst of this congregation. We appreciate your presence here this morning. We thank you that you have sent your Holy Spirit to be with us, to strengthen us, to call us up short when we need to have that done to us. Lord, we appreciate uh, the fact that in the difficult moments of life, uh, passing of a friend or colleague or parishioner, someone that we, someone that we knew and do serve you, Lord, those, those times are difficult, but we depend upon your Holy Spirit to bring us comfort. Uh, we think of those words from the prophet Isaiah, comfort my people, comfort my people. Yes, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to bring us comfort. Lord, it's, uh, it's always kind of a tender spot when we hear about accidents and particularly children uh, being involved in accidents, Lord, so we pray for that family. We don't know the name, maybe, uh, and we probably don't know the situation, but that doesn't keep us from imploring you, Lord, to take care of things for that family, to, to heal those who were hurt, uh, to Lord to calm calm down their fears about having having been involved in, in an accident, or just to let them settle settle back into life, and Lord, if they are believers, settle back into you. If they are not, Lord, help this to be a wake up call, which maybe allows someone to testify to your mercy and grace in their lives. 
Lord, we have a couple of events coming up in our congregation which give us an opportunity uh, not only to have fellowship with each other, but give us an opportunity to invite others to join in our fellowship here. Lord, we pray that we would be a welcoming community of your people, that we would be open and joyful in the presence of others, that they would see a light in our lives that perhaps they have not explored or turned on in their own. Lord, draw them into this fellowship of your people. Lord, help us to be hospitable. Lord, and to greet people the way you always greeted uh, folks and always tried to serve them, sometimes in ways that we could understand, like at the wedding in Cana of Galilee or at the Last Supper when you knelt to wash your disciples' feet. Uh, but you were always gracious, always gracious to people, Lord. Help us to be that way with others as we have this opportunity in these next two events, and especially this evening when we do expect visitors to be in our midst. Lord, we thank you for the music that you have placed in our world, music that uh, we appreciate so much for the folks who play and sing here. And Lord, uh, music just in the air and the, and the, the kind of structure of the world, Lord, that is, that is hospitable to music and soothing to people to hear or making them joyful. Lord, we are so grateful for that in our, in our lives. Lord, bring us together in that way. Lord, we thank you for the rental of the manse. That was a concern for the session and for the congregation. Lord, so now you have, you have provided a couple for that uh, that arrangement. So, Lord, thank you for that. And Lord, we pray for the, um, the future of this church. Lord, there's a good um, there's a good core of people here. And Lord, I pray that you would bless the nominating committee. Watch over them. Give them direction. <coughs> help them to discern the kind of person or persons who would be helpful here to the ministry that you want to do in this community and who will care for these people very well. Lord, you have encouraged us at all times in our lives to pray as you taught your disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And, uh, our hymn as we follow that up with more praise and thanksgiving is number 478, uh, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. And I think we can remain seated for this, this hymn today, 478.
God of grace. Now you have the opportunity to give your regular tithes and offerings to the Lord. You have the special offering for the hunger uh, program. But now bring your regular tithes and offerings to the Lord. Begotten, ere the worlds began to be, he is Alpha and Omega, he the source, the ending of the things that are that happen, and that future year shall see evermore and evermore. for the wisdom to know how to use these offerings well. Please direct our session and those that have responsibility for that. Give them the wisdom from on high so that we can use this to further your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. The uh, scripture lesson for uh, today is uh, in an insert in your bulletin, and uh, we're kind of following along uh, in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, the, the plan uh, has been, um, after we finished uh, our Christmas uh, celebration, the plan has been to aim, first of all, for Ash Wednesday, which is coming up on the 22nd of February. And then after Ash Wednesday, um, we'll be aiming for Easter. Uh, so we're, gonna, we're going to continue Jesus' preparation for a few more weeks. And then, as uh, we see in the Gospel of Luke, it really gains a momentum of Jesus heading toward Jerusalem 
and the ministry that he was going to do in Jerusalem. So that's kind of where we are in our progression at the, the present time. And this is a particularly important passage today. Uh, it's the temptations of Jesus. And uh, it's so significant because uh, Jesus is going to need the strength that he gains from surviving and surpassing and overcoming these temptations for further temptations that he will be forced to suffer as he gets closer and closer to the end of his earthly mission. And uh, as we go through our reading today, I might uh, stop at uh, a few points along the way just to clarify a few points about the reading. And, uh, you know, they're just going to be extra for the sermon. You don't have to pay any extra. They just come free, okay, like the freebies. Listen to the Word of God. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Remember last week when we saw that the Spirit came down and rested on Jesus? Jesus was now full of the Holy Spirit. He had been prepared for the temptations that he would face. He left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Don't miss that. This was part of God's plan that he should be tempted. Because in this scripture, as in other places in the New Testament, the word, the Greek word, um, and it's, it's a strange sounding word, but of course it's in Greek, but it's parazo. Parazo means to test or to tempt. And I wonder if you've ever thought about the difference between temptation and testing. Because it's the same word in Greek. Okay? The difference is the motive. If the motive is to tempt somebody, that means that you're trying to get them to fall into sin. That's what temptation is going astray from God's plan and falling into or jumping into sin. But the other meaning for parazzo is to test. Because you don't get any stronger if your will or your muscles or any other part of your body, your brain, you don't get any stronger in that part unless it's tested. You know, that's why these athletes walk, work out. That's why I get up and, and walk five days a week, you know, to test that I'm gaining strength. So, Jesus was definitely led by the Spirit because he needed this testing to continue to gain strength in the Lord. He was led into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Now the devil has another plan altogether. He's got another motive. He wants Jesus to sin. He wants Jesus to turn away from God. He was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, now, in your, uh, in your card that you have there, the next word is if. It's if you are the Son of God. That same word can also and undoubtedly does mean in this scripture, since. The devil knew who Jesus was. He, he knows that he's the Son of God. He knows that he has special powers to do things. But he's trying to get Jesus to use those powers in a way that would not honor God, but would in fact honor the devil. So what he's saying there is, since you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. 
You know, the devil's saying, I know you can do it, and I know you're hungry. Well, just take care of the situation. Turn the stone into bread, and then you won't be hungry anymore. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Wow. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in, in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me. And I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered him. It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple, up on the very highest pinnacle of the temple. Since you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, imagine the devil quoting scripture to Jesus. He will command his angels concerning you and guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Now that's a that's an accurate quotation. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Here ends the reading of God's holy word, and to God's name be glory and praise now and in the age to come. Will you join me for a brief moment of prayer? Lord Jesus, we so desperately need to understand um, the scripture, to understand how to um, meet and overcome temptation. We so desperately need to have the, the wherewithal, the, 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 the spiritual muscle to resist the temptation that comes to us. Lord, help us to understand this scripture today. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, it's not too hard to understand uh, how Jesus was tempted, and we can kind of um, kind of understand in three parts this scripture because there were three temptations, and the first one was uh, clearly clearly a physical temptation. Okay, and what the devil is saying to Jesus: Listen, you you created the world. You were, the, you were the voice of God, you were the word of God which spoke into existence everything that is. And so you have authority over all those things of creation. And um, just, you're hungry already. So why not just use your, use your power, just turn this stone into bread, take a bite of the bread, and you won't be hungry anymore. It almost seems like a sensible thing to do, right? That's what the devil is portraying anyhow. But, but Jesus, Jesus has an idea of what the devil is really trying to do is to, is to get Jesus focused on himself and on the devil and away from God. To satisfy his own need. No, I mean, we could put any need in there, right? To, just to satisfy your need, whether it goes against the scripture, is consistent with the scripture, or whether you know it to be a bad, a bad thing to do or not. 
And Jesus recognizes that and he overcomes that that by using his spiritual preparation. And, you know, of course, if you, if you fasted for 40 days, you would be hungry. But if you use that 40 days of fasting to grow closer and closer to God and let more and more of the relationship with God through the Holy Spirit build up in you, then that bodily hunger wouldn't be the most important thing in your life. What would still be the most important thing in your life would be to fulfill those commands of Scripture that teach us how to live and to shed God's mercy throughout the world. So Jesus does remember that. Okay? He does remember that, and he says, people don't live on bread alone. But by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know, we, we have to we have to catch catch on here that even though food is important. It's not the most important thing in life. No. We can live without food, at least for a time, but we cannot live successfully without the Word of God. That's absolutely essential to this life and the life to come. Absolutely essential. Well, the, the devil, the devil is thwarted at that. So he's trying to figure out something else, right? Something else that might tempt Jesus. So the, the next temptation is, is an interesting one, um, you know, as Luke outlines things here. Um, it says that the devil offered to Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, all the grandeur of the world, all the things that would put you as the number one thing in the world, all of that kind of thing, the devil offered to Jesus. Now, we, we might still debate whether um, the devil is lying by saying, well, all that authority has been given to me and I can give it to whomever I choose. That, that might be problematic. But at least he's trying to fool Jesus into thinking that he can do that. And the key to the temptation is for Jesus, he can, according to the devil, he can have all authority, all the kingdoms of the world, and he can short circuit the process. Remember, some of you will remember in the Gospel of Matthew at the Great Commission at the end in chapter 28, Jesus says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In other words, Jesus has received all authority in heaven and on earth, but he could not short circuit the process from when he was being baptized and tempted, he had to go through the rest of his mission to receive that authority. I'll let you think about that for just a few minutes. I'm going to come back to that one. But think about whether we want to short circuit the process, lots of processes in life. Well, this one doesn't work for, for Jesus. He says, no, I'm on a mission. And I'm going to continue with that mission. Then the third, uh, the third round in this battle of temptation is a particularly, particularly re 
religious temptation. Okay, this is, this is one that's more identifiable for sure as a religious temptation. Takes Jesus to the temple, sets him up on the pinnacle of the temple and says, just throw yourself off here and God's angels, as it, said, as it says in the scripture, now the devil is quoting scripture, God's angels will come and lift you up. They'll carry you up on their wings. And this is particularly significant for Jesus because this was one of the, the persistent stories of the coming of the Messiah was that he would come at the temple and in some spectacular display like Superman coming down from, you know, the Daily Planet building in the movies or something, the, the, the Messiah would come down and everybody, everybody would then have to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the one. And again, again, Jesus says, it's not supposed to be that way, okay? He wasn't going to conform himself to the legend, even though, now think about this, even though having appeared that way, people would not have said, things that they did say later on in his ministry. Well, he wasn't even from Jerusalem. He was from Galilee. Does anything good ever come out of Galilee? Who were his parents? Any, anyhow. How was, he, how was he baptized? Just like anybody else. Okay. Who were his parents? Well, some unknown couple that we never even heard of before. But Jesus resisted that temptation. And he resisted that temptation. And he trusts in the word of God and following the direction of the Holy Spirit. Instead of hearing the, the siren song the beautiful song of temptation that sometimes gets in our ears and in our hearts and calls us away, drags us away, if you will, from God's plan for us. Now, what about us? How do these things and Jesus' resistance to them, how do they measure up for us? You know, I often think about, um, I guess, analogies or, or things, but th this whole thing strikes me like an Olympic boxing match. You know, in the Olympics, they have like three rounds of boxing, and then they decide who the winner is if nobody's been knocked down or knocked out. They decide. But, you know, those, those three rounds are pretty strenuous rounds. Um, and, you know, in here, the, they're very furious, and there's lots of action in the sense of the devil and Jesus back and forth. And Jesus calls us. You know, he has fought the good fight for us, even through to death. He has fought that fight for us and been resurrected on our behalf. And he's calling on us in no uncertain terms to depend on that same Holy Spirit and to resist and overcome temptation the way he has done it. The way he has done it. So let's, let's take a look a little closer. Look. What about physical temptation? Right? 
if you're if you're honest, I think we've all faced physical temptation, and probably we've all given in to it. You know, and there's there's different kinds of things. I mean, we uh, I guess maybe most of us at first think of like uh, we we eat things that we shouldn't eat, or we eat more of something than we should. You know, it's because it's tempting. You know, and even beyond that, we we do things with our physical bodies that we know we know for sure are not good for our physical bodies. You know, you know, my when I was growing up. Back in uh, back in the day in West Virginia, my grandpa was actually a um, elementary school principal. When they had um, they had grades one through eight at the school, and he taught there for a few years, and then he became the principal of the school and uh, stayed as principal for thirty some years before he retired. And my grandpa always smoked pipe. And, you know, I thought growing up when I was a kid, I always thought, you know, when I, when I get old enough, you know, I'm going to smoke pipe. You know, the, the smell at first seemed was pretty pleasant and, and things. But before I got grown up to the place where you could say on your own, I'm going to smoke pipe, they found out that pipe smoking wasn't that good for you. You know, and that maybe spared me a lifetime of trouble. That realization that, wait a minute, the thing I was thinking of doing, that physical thing I was thinking of doing, isn't very good. And there's some things that are even worse than that. We had our two of our older teenage grandsons with us this week. They went skiing at uh, Snowshoe on Thursday, didn't get back till midnight. <laughs> I thought, about 11.30, I thought, wow, are you skiing at midnight? What is this? No, they were fine, they, they got back. But part of the weekend adventure was not just that kind of adventure, but my wife, did a presentation with them owing to a, their age and circumstance did a presentation about sexual temptation about pornography you know and they were just at the right age because that that's the, the, the kids are the ones that are often targeted you know we uh, we have human trafficking in this area, it, it goes it goes on all the time, up and down 81. You know, I think I think we've had a program here about that, right? Yeah, and um, we we've had that same program, so we've seen that same program several times about how bad it really is as people take advantage of. These and, and people for various reasons are, are tempted. You know, physical temptation is very difficult to resist. I was at a uh, Promise Keepers meeting some years ago now, and um, one of the events, they had all the pastors line up in this uh, big auditorium in a circle. Okay? And then they had people, they told people in the, in the audience, you can come down and one of these pastors will pray for a particular need that you have. Just come down to any one of them. And so I was in the in this inner circle and then people started coming. Yeah, they were ready. They were ready. And so this fellow came up to me and he said, uh, I said, well, what, you know, what's your concern or what's your, what's your problem? And he said, oh, you know, and I said, no, I didn't know, really. And 
he said, well, it's, uh, and he had trouble saying the word, it's pornography. You know, a, a, young, a young man out of nowhere. And I had the opportunity to pray for him that he would not be overcome by that temptation, that he would resist, that the Holy Spirit would help him to resist that kind of temptation. That's physical temptation. How about taking the easy way out? Anybody ever take the easy way out? <laughs> Never, right? <laughs> right. You know, I, I was pastoring, of course, but I have had a long career at the community college here. It's now Mountain Gate Community College, and I've been teaching there for over 35 years. And uh, sometimes I have wondered whether at least some of the students that I've had in those 35 years, they just wanted the grade. They didn't care about the learning, they didn't care about the lectures, they didn't care about the background, they didn't care about what it was going to be good for. They just wanted the grade to get through. Wow. You know, I tried, I hope successfully, or at least sometimes successfully, I tried to tell them that they were, they were too young to know how much they were going to need the subject that we were talking about. Because, because every one of those subjects that I didn't like at Hampton Sydney, that I didn't like in law school, that I didn't like in seminary, the truth of the matter is I used every one of them eventually. So I'm glad I didn't take the easy way out. But there are some people who are completely expedient and do take the easy way out, no matter what the situation is. You know, I, this, is a, this is a terrible story, but it's not dirty. I don't mean terrible in that way. But my, my uncle was a professor at Shepherd University in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. That's where Sharon went to went to uh, college. My uncle was a professor there and there was, a, there was a, an administrator, there was a president of a, of a faculty and uh, he wanted to fire the basketball coach. But he didn't have any reason to fire the basketball coach. The basketball coach was doing a fairly good job. He hadn't done anything wrong. He hadn't abused any kids. He had no reason whatsoever to fire him. So he devised a plan. He called the coach in and said to the coach, Coach, you're doing a wonderful job. He said, I can't tell you how pleased I am with the job you're doing, and you deserve a raise. But in the pay scale for the state, I can't give you a raise. But I have some discretionary money, and I can use that discretionary money to give you about a $3,000 raise if you don't sign your regular contract, just, just let that go, and then we'll put you on this special fund that I've got. So the coach goes out of the room thinking, this is my most lucky day. I mean, it wasn't his lucky day. He was dealing with the devil. The day after contracts were to be signed for the teachers and coaches at the college, the day after contracts were to be signed, the president called a press conference and said he was going to hire a new basketball coach. And when they asked him why, he said, because the coach never turned in his contract. that 
just doing what's expedient, not facing up to the reality of the situation, taking the easy way out. And of course, what they found eventually when this happened more than once at the school, they began to investigate his prior career and they found out that at every institution, he had only stayed a fairly short period of time, in other words, until they caught up with him. But none of those institutions gave him a bad recommendation because they wanted to get rid of him. It's so easy. It's so easy to take the easy way out. But Jesus says you have to resist that. What about the temptation to just let God take care of you? Okay. That's what the devil is saying. Just jump off of the temple and God's going to take care of you. It says so in scripture. There's a difference, Jesus says, between having faith in God, trusting in God, and putting God to the test. Have you ever known anybody like that? That, well, I'll go ahead with this, and if it doesn't turn out, if it doesn't pan out, okay, well, God will fix it. In other words, in effect, you're wanting to control God. You want God to save you from mistakes he's already told you you shouldn't be involved with. The thing is to stay in sync with God. Not run ahead and then expect, well, if something happens, God's going to make it all right. Or to lag behind me. No, to be in step with the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus was in these temptations, to be in step with the Holy Spirit. You know, the, the perfect image for that being in step is, can you remember those, those revolving doors that they used to have at, at oh, department stores and other, other kinds of places? If you, if you went in too quickly, you busted your face on the part in front, right? If you went in too slowly, you got hit in the backside. You had to stay in sync. That's what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to stay in sync with the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that spirit knows that we're going to be tempted, but he's going to give us the way. He's going to give us the way to stay in sync and to support us during the temptation. Now, it wouldn't be called temptation if it were easy to resist. You know, I've I know, uh, I think I used this as an illustration some time ago here about uh, you know, Brussels sprouts is not one of my favorite foods. And if anybody says to me, you know, you have to give up Brussels sprouts, I say, oh, perfect, <coughs> perfect. You know, and that's, as kids, we used to do that for Lent. Give up something for Lent. And then I try to think of the hardest thing that I didn't like, and then I give that up. Okay, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about calling upon the Holy Spirit to help us resist temptation. But how did the passage end? How did the passage end? It says the devil left him until an opportune time. Eventually, we're going to come to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. That was a most opportune time. And we'll see what Jesus does there. Let us pray. 
Lord, we all know, deep down in our hearts, we all know that temptation is no laughing matter. And that we all are tempted in various ways, Lord. So, Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us as our coach, as our mentor, as a person who's in our corner to encourage us in the fight. Lord, be there for us and help us to resist the temptation of the devil. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now our hymn to follow up is God of Grace and God of Glory. And we're going to sing the first and second verses and then four and five. It's number 420 in the hymn book. Friends, go forth in the strength of the Spirit and resist and overcome the temptation that comes into your lives. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of that Holy Spirit watch over you and guard you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.